together. Yeah, but, uh, you know, Damascus is not just Muslim. There are Christians in, in Syria too. Uh, so, um, you know, that the Jews used uh, non-Jewish children to bake their uh, their Passover. Once again, we're face to face with the ignorance and credulity. You know, he just dismisses this. This is so pathetic. It's not worthy of that. But you, you hear this stuff all the time. You know, in fact, this new movie, Borat, whatever it is. You know, I don't think that's really helpful. What he does, I don't really like what he does, frankly. But you know, it's fairly sophisticated, tongue-in-cheek British humor. And uh, you know, he's a totally Jewish guy. Uh, you know, and uh, very proud of his heritage as well. Uh, but he impersonates a, a, a sort of Muslim or a Muslim journalist or whatever, and he says the most outrageous things about uh, Jews and other people and so on and so forth. And uh, sort of the reason he says it is to have a laugh about the whole thing. Not, not, it's not serious for him, it's just to, to have a laugh. You know, he impersonates this journalist from uh, Kazakhstan or someplace, and then he goes and interviews people. Uh, you know, he's had a program doing this, and I don't think it's right because he doesn't, a lot of them, he doesn't tell that he's just putting them on, you know, having them on. But of course, apparently it's quite popular. A lot of you guys have gone to the movie this weekend. I see it's the biggest money maker this past weekend. It's probably in his TV, you think, was very, very popular. But, you know, stupid people take that kind of thing seriously. They, they hear these kind of slogans and they think that, you know, there may be some truth to those things. That, you know, he's just laughing because he's an Oxford type and he's a very well educated and he's having a good old time there putting people on and, uh, and making fools out of them all. And if you're laughing, you probably see what he's talking about, but I'm not sure the average person can really uh, always um, distinguish between the fact and fiction in these things. And certainly the people he interviews are almost always uh, like taken in totally. And it's frightening some of the things. I mean, they make total fools of themselves and it's kind of frightening. I mean, I, I just, I, I can't watch it so much. I just, uh, it's too old for me to watch, frankly. But you guys are all laughing, so I see you seem to like it. <laughs> anyway, as he says, you know, we're with this ignorance and credulity of the mob, just dismisses of the way Borat is basically doing uh, of the mobs of Asia and Europe, he's just making a joke out of it all, which are as ready today as they have been in the past 2,000 years to believe any calumny directed against you. Okay, this, this is your Zionist text. I gotta forgive, you must forgive me if these people are interested in the problems that the Jews are facing. I don't mean to keep repeating the same mantra, but this is something that we're going to get here. I was painfully reminded for the first time in many years that I belong to an unfortunate, blind, despised, dispersed people, but one that the world has not succeeded in destroying. I like to tell this to Afro-American students in my other class, that you know they shouldn't be so down on themselves and down on everything. You know The world has not succeeded in destroying you. You've flourished in America. 40 million strong. I mean, what are you depressed about? You know, you know, wake up for God's sakes, you know. See the positive. Stop looking on the negative all the time. I mean, and people from Southeast Asia, uh, other uh, uh, areas of the world, they're not always worried about what people think of them or all the negative. They just get on with it, you know. And I try to tell my Afro Americans, you're in that class, I try to tell them this, man, but I don't think I succeed. Uh, you know, their leadership is really bereft of, uh, of a positive approach. Uh, for some reason, they want to accentuate the negative. And uh, they depress everybody, their own <laughs> groups themselves, and all the whites too. So everyone is totally depressed in the end. When in fact, there's a, there's a great success story of the Afro-American. Afro-Americans, look, they totally transplanted the native uh, populations in Brazil. I mean, there's hardly a, a, an Indian left in uh, Brazil. It's all Afro-American. I mean, that's an incredible, I don't say it's uh, success. It's an incredible success for him. And the treatment of the, of the Afro-American slaves in Brazil was 10 times worse than any treatment here in the United States. They didn't even want to keep anybody alive. They just wanted to work them to death. All the southern guys here thought of them as property to try to, uh, you know, uh, benefit from. But then in Brazil, it bring more and work with death, bring more and work with death. It's just a horror story in Brazil. And yet, they survived. And, uh, basically, um, took over the place, if you want, uh, you know, or the, uh, you know, uh, the backbone of Brazil. Anyway, 
So, um, but once the world, but one, the world has not succeeded in destroying. I think that's a good point. At that time, though, I was still greatly estranged from Judaism. I wanted to cry out in anguish an expression of my Jewish patriotism, but this emotion was immediately superseded by the greater pain which was evoked in me by the suffering of the proletariat in Europe. You know, you know look, the so proletariat in Europe, uh, that's great. You know, I'm uh, happy the proletariat has got a problem. But let the proletariat take care of itself. And the proletariat doesn't need the Moses Hess to look out for it. The proletariat has enough strength and power and men uh, women and people who are suffering this way to get on with the struggle themselves and uh, they won't miss Moses Hess <laughs> is what you know so as he says you know and Karl Marx and all these guys it's the same deal and Trotsky and all the others I mean uh, they feel they need to save the proletariat in Europe I think the proletariat didn't thank them very much for this and certainly in Russia Stalin paid Trotsky back good and proper and uh, <laughs> you know for his supposed concern for the proletariat. And uh, Hess finally decides that, okay, look, you know, there's not a lot that I can really do given my background. I've got to sort out my own people in some manner if I can. So the pure human nature of the Germans is in reality the nature of the pure German race, which uh, he's a bit of a racist here, as you see. But, but all the Germans have uh, bought this uh, on up to Hitler's time, so he's not far away from the people he's living among which can rise to the concept of humanity in theory only, but in practice has not yet transcended its innate racial sympathy. Well, there's some truth to that for his time. I think today things have changed quite a bit, hopefully. Not in Eastern Germany, by the way, but in Western. German antagonist to our Jewish national aspiration has two sources reflecting in the Jewish. So he's analyzing the reformed Jewish thing, why it's not going to be able to succeed here. That's what he's basically wanting, starting off. You see, OK, you guys think you're going to be successful in this. You're not. Because the antagonism to these aspirations reflect the dual nature of man is spiritual and natural. So he's doing rational arguments like uh, Mendelssohn was. I'm going to keep you a little over here because um, I wasted some diversions and I need as much time as I can get here. I apologize. Um, I'll keep you until the 20 of um, I apologize. For National aspirations as a whole are contrary to the theoretical and internationalism of the Germans. So you, the fact that we have these things in our prayer books, they had to get rid of them because it's uh, contrary to the um, uh, yes, theoretical internationalism of the Germans. However, in addition to this, the Germans oppose Jewish national, national aspirations because of racial antipathy, which even their noblest spirits have not overcome. The same German whose pure human nature revolted against publishing a book advocating the revival of the Jewish nationality had no objection to publishing books against Jews and Judaism, though the purpose of such works is basically opposed to pure human nature. Anyway, he's arguing about some Germans 